Is it good to go? Okay. All right, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll be talking about Pareto Optimal Solutions for Smooth Analysts, and this is based on joint work with Ryan O'Donnell of CMU. So uh, thanks to Sheng Hua for giving a nice introduction to why we should study Pareto Optimal Solutions in terms of capturing trade-offs between different objective functions. Let me actually give a different motivation for studying Pareto Optimal Solutions. It's that it can actually be an important complexity measure for understanding the performance of algorithms. So let me give a motivating example. Suppose we have the knapsack problem. So we have a vector of values and a vector of weights and some upper bound, capital W, on the total weight that we can support in the knapsack. So our goal will be to solve this problem optimally and to do so by uh, building up optimal solutions to larger and larger subproblems. Now what if I consider the universe on just the first i items? There are two to the i candidate solutions, one for every choice of which items to put in and which items to leave out. And each of them in turn has some total weight and total value. And actually, I'll plot these solutions on the uh, xy plane with the value, the total value along the y-axis. And the reason I'll use w minus the total weight is that throughout this talk, the goal will always, to be, will always be to maximize objective functions. It'll be better to have larger total value, and it'll be better to have larger remaining residual weight in the knapsack. Now, if these are the solutions that we get from looking at the entire universe, the first two to the i candidate solutions, then there are going to be some solutions which are clearly dominated by others. For example, this solution right here, well, there's another solution up and to the right. So there's another solution which has larger total value and smaller total weight. So in this case, we'll call this original solution not Pareto optimal. If there's any other candidate solution, that's simultaneously better on both objectives. And conversely, if the region up and to the right is empty. If there's no other candidate solution better on both objective functions, we'll call the point Pareto optimal. And the full set of points will be the, will be the Pareto curve. And actually, in the specific case where I'm considering all the solutions on the first i items, I'll actually refer to this as the ith Pareto curve. So now the goal will be to solve the knapsack problem exactly by building up Pareto curves for larger and larger subproblems. And actually, the size of the largest Pareto curve we encounter will actually be a measure of the runtime of this algorithm. It'll be the main bottleneck in this algorithm. So now, suppose we were trying to build up the i plus first Pareto curve from the ith Pareto curve. Well, if we extend our universe size to now include the i plus first item, there are new solutions we have to consider. Uh, for, every, for every solution on these first i plus 1 items, it really comes from a solution on the first i items and a choice of to either include or not include the i plus first item. So in fact, all the new points that we get, well, they come from an old point and a shift left and up. So for each old solution, if we, if we don't include the item, well, its total weight and total value stay put. But if we include the item, then we shift over the point by the weight of the i plus first item and up by the value of the i plus first item. So actually, you can check from this picture now. Unfortunately, gray is not coming out too well. But uh, this point that was not Pareto optimal, well, the shift left and up, this point will also not be Pareto optimal. You can see in this figure there is another candidate solution occupying the region up and to the right. And in general, this will be true that any point that we've thrown out to form the ith Pareto curve, well, we don't have to worry about what new solutions arise from it. Those solutions will also be irrelevant. So this point is not Pareto optimal. And there can be cases where we had a point which was Pareto optimal on the ith curve, but is actually no longer Pareto optimal on the i plus first curve. So if we encounter these types of solutions now, we can also throw those out. And in general, the set of remaining points will be exactly the i plus first Pareto curve. So the approach now is to build up these curves one by one. And what I was hoping to get across this discussion, this algorithm, by the way, is called dynamic programming lists, or in the specific case of Knapsack, it's called the namehauser ullman algorithm. Well, what I was hoping to get across with the previous discussion is that first, the i plus first Pareto curve can be computed from the ith one. And actually, if you implement this intelligently, it can actually be done so in linear time. If you maintain these lists as sorted orders, these Pareto curves, then actually you can compute the next Pareto curve just by an appropriate merge of two different lists. 
So in fact, PO of i plus 1 can be computed in time linear in the size of the ith Pareto curve. And a relatively trivial observation that actually solving this problem, finding the nth Pareto curve, actually solves the problem exactly that we're interested in. If we had the nth Pareto curve, we could actually compute an exactly optimal solution to the knapsack problem. All we'd have to do is check all the candidate solutions in the nth Pareto curve and find the one which has the largest total value while still having non-negative residual weight left over. So in fact, in this algorithm, this is something that's used in practice in operations research, even though it's exponential in the worst case because the sizes of these Pareto curves can blow up exponentially. In fact, this is a fairly typical example of when an algorithm as an intermediate stage enumerates the set of Pareto optimal solutions. And that's actually the main bottleneck in, al in the algorithm. Understanding whether or not the algorithm performs well in practice is equivalent to understanding how large these Pareto curves can be. So uh, this, was, this was used by Byron Bocking, who first showed that actually in the model of smooth analysis, even though the number of Pareto optimal solutions can be exponentially large in the worst case, they were able to show that in the smooth analysis model, they're actually polynomially bounded in two dimensions. So uh, I won't get into the formal model just yet because it's a little bit notation heavy. But an immediate consequence now is actually that knapsack can be solved in smooth polynomial time, just by the algorithm that I explained on the previous two slides. And interestingly enough, this is actually the first example of a problem that's NP-hard and yet is easy in the model of smooth analysis. In fact, moreover, their results even generalize a long line of results on random instances. For a long time, people had studied things like what happens if in a knapsack instance, the weights are distributed uniformly at random on some interval. Can I solve it exactly in expected polynomial time? And that becomes a very difficult probability question, even understanding what the optimal solution value looks like. Yet here they were able to generalize all of this work on specific cases of random instances and were able to show that as long as the density functions of the weights and values were themselves bounded, they were never too concentrated, then in fact the namehauser allman algorithm runs in expected polynomial time. So uh, let me now formally introduce the model, and then I'll start to talk about what the previous results are and um, where we can go from there. But um, the model will be a little bit notation heavy because it'll be a generalization to the one that I described for the knapsack case. And actually, all these little bells and whistles will be important for various applications. But for now, you can imagine a model where an adversary is trying to force many Pareto optimal solutions in expectation. So the adversary will get to choose quite a few things. The first thing the adversary gets to choose is the set of candidate solutions. This was easy to describe in the case of knapsack because it was in fact all of 0, 1 to the n. It was every choice of which items I can put in the knapsack and which ones I want to leave out. And more generally, you can actually choose combinatorially interesting families. So for example, um, you know, if n were the number of edges in some graph, then I could just as well choose this set, if I were the adversary, as maybe the sets of edges that form a spanning tree in my graph. Or even more, I could, I could choose the, uh, the set as the sets of edges which form Hamiltonian cycles. The adversary will be interested in then choosing D linear objective functions and trying to force many Pareto optimal solutions and expectation. The first objective function the adversary will actually, will, he'll be allowed to choose it adversarially. So even in the case of knapsack, the fact that you're allowed to choose one objective function adversarially and it's not perturbed means that you can perturb either the weights or values in a knapsack instance and it still runs in smooth polynomial time. The remaining objective functions will actually be linear. So the adversary will choose some d minus 1 linear objective functions from the 0, 1 to the n space to, to r. And in fact, in general, these random variables, the adversary will even choose the distribution of them. Not just the value and then perturb them by Gaussians, he'll even be able to choose an arbitrary perturbation uh, where these random variables just are random variables on the range plus minus one and the density function has to be bounded by phi. So actually this level of generality is important in some contexts where you want to consider more than just Gaussian perturbations for things like applications to mechanism design as I'll allude to later. So in any case, this is the model. 
I apologize for all the notation, but uh, it's good to get this out of the way. Are there any questions that I can answer now? Okay. Oh, is there a question? Uh -huh. Well, no, it can be arbitrary nonlinear, so that's what allows it to encode a lot of combinatorial structures. So, you know, a lot of the bells and whistles in this are what allow you to, uh, to move to models which are somewhat more realistic of how you might measure data. So uh, allowing one arbitrary one allows a lot more you know, freedom in the expressive power of the adversary. Okay, so if I let PO be the set of pre-optimal solutions, as I mentioned, Bayer and Valking showed that for the two-dimensional case, the expected number of pre-optimal solutions is polynomially bounded. And this is what had implications for knapsack in particular. And this was later improved uh, to a tight analysis by Bayer, Roglin, and Valking, and they actually showed that a, a matching upper and lower bound that the answer should be n squared. That an adversary can force n squared for optimal solutions and expectation, and he really can't force more than that. Phi is the bound on the density, the down, uh, on the density function, that's right. And uh, Roglin and Tang then showed a very strong generalization of this and showed that actually for any constant number of objective functions, it's still polynomially bounded. So even if you want to solve multi-objective optimization problems, which you want to find multi-dimensional Pareto curves, you still can do so efficiently in the smooth model for a constant number of objective functions. But actually, the, the dependence was uh, not so great on, uh, on this number of objective functions. In fact, the exponent of this polynomial itself depended exponentially on d. So uh, actually, a lot of bounds on smooth analysis can be sort of slack in what actually the polynomial is. So actually, the focus of this talk will be on getting a much tighter analysis of this uh, through a uh, uh, an interesting approach, let's say. So one other, uh, one other result I want to mention in this line is that a recent paper of Dugmi and Roughgarden actually used the results in this line, not exactly the number of pareto optimal solutions, but used the stronger property to actually show a, a black box reduction in mechanism design that any uh, FP task can be transformed to a truthful and expectation FP task. So uh, our results, we end up getting a, a much stronger bound on the number of pre-optimal solutions. We show that, in fact, the exponent's dependence on D can actually be improved to linear in D. And uh, it's a somewhat technical proof, so I'll just say something um, somewhat cryptic for now, and then I'll get into why we're able to make this work later. But uh, the key in all of these works, these previous works, is actually in choosing the right definitions. You choose the right definitions to analyze these random events, and actually the whole thing becomes easy. The difficulty is that the definitions become very convoluted. Even for you know, the case of dimension two, as you go up, they become even more complicated. And you get worse and worse bounds on this exponent. So part of our contribution is actually finding a more principled way to get the definitions. We do it implicitly through an algorithm that actually constructs the family of events that we analyze. And I'll explain that more in detail. That's not meant to be clear right now. So I'll mention that this answer is a recent conjecture of Tang. And just to compare and contrast this to a distributional model, what if I took all the power out of the adversary? What if instead of having all this combinatorial structure that allowed me to capture things like perturbations to knapstack instances, what if instead I just asked, what happens if you take the same number of points as random, uncorrelated samples from a d-dimensional Gaussian? So there's no more combinatorial structure across what are the 0, 1 vectors of these different items. Instead, if I, if I hit the sample button 2 to the n times, it's been known actually since the 70s that the expected number of pareto optimal solutions is exactly n to the d minus 1. So actually what our result is, it actually shows that it's a square factor off from this purely distributional model where the adversary has no power and it's totally Gaussian distributed. What's actually interesting is that for the case of d equals 2, well, if you recall, I said that actually in the smooth analysis model, the matching upper and lower bounds were n squared. And here in this Gaussian land, the answer is actually n. So actually the square factor is already necessary for the case of two dimensions, and in fact, this is why this was conjectured n to the 2d minus 2 as exactly the right answer, is that it should be a square factor off all the way up. 
Although no lower bound better than the Gaussian case is known right now. Are there any questions? Okay, so uh, I'm not going to be able to explain entirely how this result goes through, but to make some of my statements a little bit less cryptic, we have to get our hands a little bit dirty. My goal is to explain some of the previous proofs, the Bayer Roglin Vocking proof, and then I'll actually give a reinterpretation of this result. So, uh, so the, the first goal is actually to come up with a slightly, I'll, I'll only work with dimension two until the very end of the talk. Now, uh, the first thing is I want to give a slightly easier characterization of when a, uh, when a point is Pareto optimal. Well, I can imagine if I took all my candidate solutions, they have some objective one value, some objective two value. What if I start all the way on the right from the largest objective one value point and I sweep from right to left? Well, as I encounter points, when will they be Pareto optimal? Certainly the first point that I encounter will be Pareto optimal. It has the largest objective one value of all points. So it's clearly Pareto optimal. And in fact, now any subsequent point that I encounter as I sweep from right to left will actually be Pareto optimal if and only if it lands above the highest point that I've seen so far. So for example, this point is not Pareto optimal. It doesn't cross this barrier. And this point is Pareto optimal. It crosses the barrier and it causes us to move up the barrier. So now this point is not Pareto optimal because it doesn't cross this new barrier when we encounter it. There is another point that's up and to the right. So let me work with this condition now and let me explain the general pattern. So I mentioned that all the work in these previous papers is through definitions. So at a high level, our goal is to count the expected number of Pareto optimal solutions. And in fact, the pattern that these papers use is we first define some complete family of events. Some family of events which has the property that every time there's a Pareto optimal solution, there's some unique event that I can blame. There's some unique event that occurs because of that Pareto optimal solution. So if we had this type of domination condition, it would mean that if we could bound the expected number of events that occur, then we could bound the expected number of Pareto optimal solutions. But this is actually a rather easy condition to, to satisfy. I could, for example, uh, choose a complete family of events that for every possible solution it just asks, is that solution Pareto optimal? That's certainly a complete family. But it's useless to us because it doesn't make the task of bounding the chance that the event occurs any easier. So in fact, that's what I mean by all the work is actually in the definition. So the events will actually become quite convoluted just for the purpose of making this last statement easy to do. So for example, you know, now what, let me explain the events which Bayer, Roglin, and Vocking use for the two-dimensional case. These will be the easiest events to explain. Suppose we have some Pareto optimal solution x. Well, we, wanna, we want to define an event based on something that must have happened if x is Pareto optimal. So we can imagine that as we started sweeping from right to left, when we encountered x, it had to be above everything else we'd seen so far. And actually, similarly, the common case is that if we continue this sweep starting at x, we actually expect that at some point we'll encounter a point even above x. We expect that we'll encounter some point y that's above x, because if not, x really has a unique identity. He's the largest objective two value of any point. So I won't worry about that case. And the common case is that I can take some y that's actually the first point I encounter when I sweep from right to left starting at x that's actually above x. So this region in space between x and y should actually be empty. But now, x and y themselves are different solutions in 0, 1 to the n. So they have to differ in some index. Let's say it's index i. And for simplicity, let's say x sub i equals 1 and y sub i equals 0. So this is almost the picture of what the event looks like. There's one more technical detail that you know if you don't want to, don't worry about it. It's that we can actually draw some interval around x, which if we draw it narrower enough, It'll actually not contain y. y will be above it. x will be inside the interval. But the rest of this interval will be empty. You can think of really what we care about is the limit as this interval becomes very, very small. Because we really want to perform an integral to understand the expected number of Pareto optimal solutions. But now this is actually our complete family of events. Really, let me try and formalize just saying that the event is 
what, what I drew on the last slide actually occurs. So the event is some interval i where it has width epsilon. And the event that we're interested in now is that there's some parade optimal solution x that, well, it has to land inside the interval. But moreover, if we let y be as in the picture, it's the, you know, the first point when we sweep from right to left starting in x that's above the interval, well, that y and x, they have to disagree on this index i. y sub i has to be equal to 0, and x sub i has to be equal to 1. So you'll see already that even in the case of two dimensions, in order to make this analysis work, I need these, um, these events which have this conditional chain of things that happen. Y is the first point which is above this interval and so on. But the virtue of choosing this sort of convoluted definition is that it actually makes the analysis become easy now. It's almost just an immediate consequence if you work out what the real definition is. For example, suppose we had that event E. And we're interested in, does it happen? So we have some interval i, and this is really the operative interval that we care about, does x land in here? And does all that chain of events happen? But now what we can do is we can actually sample all the randomness out of objective 2, except for one missing random variable. That missing random variable will still be enough for us to show that this event is unlikely. So now, suppose we had all these other variables in for objective 2, except for this one missing one on this index i that we really care about for this event. Well, you know, now if we pretend that this missing random variable is 0 for simplicity, then every point is mapped to some objective 2 value, and every point is mapped to some objective 1 value. And actually, some of these points' locations in the plane are already fixed. We know that you know, among the entire set of candidate solutions, some have their ith index equal to 0, some have their ith index equal to 1. Now these blue points that have their ith index equal to 0, they don't actually depend on the missing variable in the second objective function. So actually this remaining randomness we have, these blue points are actually frozen in the plane. What that means is we know among the blue points which ones are above the interval, which ones are below the interval, and we in fact know what's the rightmost point that's above the interval. That actually, that identity of that point actually has to be the y in order for our event to occur. So what we're actually doing is we're being able to deconstruct the event to figure out who y is and later who x is. That's the basis of this analysis. Now we know that x, if the event occurs, actually has to happen to the right of y. So it has to be among these green points. Now, conceivably, we might be worried about any one of these green points landing inside the interval. But actually, it turns out that there'll only be one green point that can actually cause our event to occur. Because all these green points, and these black points too, uh, essentially these non-blue points, well, they move up together with this missing random variable. So, for example, if you know, I sampled this missing index, and all these green and black points moved up together, what happens if some other parade optimal solution lands inside that interval. Well, even though z has landed inside that interval and there is a parade optimal solution in that interval, we're actually not worried about it because we know that x actually has to be above the interval. Yet x, by design, agrees on the ith index with z. So this means even though there is a parade optimal solution inside this interval, we actually should be blaming it on a different event. We should be blaming it on some other index which these two points are different on. So actually the only point which can land inside the interval and cause the event to occur is the unique green point that's highest up. So uh, I hope you can at least get the intuition behind the analysis, but now let me actually just give a reinterpretation of what this is actually doing. So there's one interpretation which is just based on a complete family of events and analyzing it, which sounds fine because it's a union bound. But actually what we're really doing is we're, we're defining these events implicitly through an algorithm. There's some transcription algorithm, which what it can do is it can take all the randomness after it sees everything, and for every pre-optimal solution, it finds an event to blame. So there's an algorithm. I mean, it doesn't need to be efficient, but there's an algorithm which, given a parade optimal solution x, will find some interval that x is contained in. It finds some y, which is you know up into the left of it, and it finds some index where they're different. This algorithm spits out the description of the event. 
And what we're actually doing, that, so this already defines a way to see that this family of events is complete. The statement that it's complete is just that on input any pre optimal solution, this algorithm outputs something. That's some event that we can blame. But now the analysis is actually like a speculative execution of this. Because what we're actually doing is given the, given the description of the event, given the index i, given the interval, given x sub i and y sub i, well, we were actually able to look at just some of the randomness. We were able to look at everything, all the randomness in objective two, except for this one missing random variable. And we were still able to figure out who the x is that we should be blaming. We are still able to recover a unique point that must land inside the interval in order for the event to occur. But since we only looked at some of the randomness, in fact, that remaining randomness that we have left over is enough to show that the event is unlikely that it's now unlikely for x to land inside the interval. So that's how this pattern of analysis is going to work, is that you know, for the case of as you go higher and higher dimensions, the events become much more complicated, the chain of you know, conditions that you need to verify. But at the end of the day, you can actually write down a simple algorithm, which you're just saying that uh, you know, given some parade optimal solution, it outputs some description. And the entire analysis then is that given those clues about what's occurred, another algorithm can take that as an input and look at just some of the randomness. And actually, step by step, it will, you know, it will have the same output as the original algorithm. So you, the method of analysis is actually through invariance of algorithms. So the algorithms themselves are you know, page to describe or something, but it's much simpler than the family of events that they actually implicitly define. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is I'll just give you an idea for what the family of events now looks like in, in higher dimensions, in dimension three even. Uh, so for example, now in this case, uh, for three objective functions, we can imagine sweeping according to this first objective function. We take all the candidate solutions, and we start from the largest objective one value, and we consider them in decreasing objective one value order. Now, when a point occurs, the first one is, again, clearly preto-optimal. It has the largest objective one value. For a new point that occurs to be preto-optimal, it just has to be preto-optimal on the two-dimensional objective two, objective three plane. So for example, this next point is preto-optimal when, it, when, it, when we encounter it. This next point is as well, and this point is not. Because now when we encounter it, it's not on this two-dimensional surface. There's another point that's better in objective two and objective three that occurred earlier and hence has larger objective one value. So in fact, now if we encounter some new parade optimal solution x, we need to define some notion of the common case, what events happen in order for this point x to be parade optimal. And the common case, we actually expect that there'll be some later y that we encounter, which will be up and to the right of x. This, again, will be the common case. Otherwise, we'll actually be in a lower dimensional instance. And the trick ends up being that if you look at all the points before, uh, so x and y, first of all, differ on some you know, index i because they're different 0, 1 to the n solutions. So in fact, what we'll output from our algorithm, well, one of the things we'll output is what's the index i where x and y disagree. And we'll, in fact, output whatever the values are of x and y. Well, we know that actually of all the points that occur before y, which have larger objective one than y, x has to be on the two-dimensional Pareto surface that I've drawn here in a dashed line. In fact, even if we take the points from z, which are different on this ith index, so it includes x, well, this restricted set of points, x is still Pareto optimal. So what this means then is that we can essentially recurse now because we can imagine since x is on this lower dimensional Pareto surface, but now all these blue, then this blue and this red point, they all agree on a new index. So we can actually recurse to another case where we try and sweep along objective two. And we know that now in the common case, exactly as before, there's some later point z that's actually up and to the left. So what we end up outputting is actually uh, for the index j that x and z differ on, we output this full table of, first of all, what's the ith index, what's the jth index, and what are the values of x, y, and z that are the sort of key agents in this entire argument. And the trick behind all of this now is that there's some way 
to actually speculatively execute this algorithm. This algorithm outputs enough information that it can look at just some of the randomness and still be able to figure out first who Y is, then who Z is, and in turn who X is. And that's how the analysis works. So that's actually all I really wanted to say about this. Uh, are there any questions I can answer? Thanks, Christy. Oh, thanks. You seem to have a question. Yeah, well, it's just so you gave this. I mean, you gave this really nice uh, um, application at the beginning for the two D case, you know, with knapsack and how uh -huh. it seems like they're really like a proof from the book about why, in particular, average case versions of knapsack are uh -huh. fast and stuff. So, so I mean, what you, are there, what would be the killer applications once you sort of jack up D a little bit, you know, say D equal three then or something? Right. Well, um, so there, you know, so uh, as long as the objective function you're interested in is some monotone increasing function of these different objectives, if it's some arbitrary, you know, really complicated nonlinear function, but it's still monotone. Then people actually, you know, the way they end up solving this is by building up the Pareto curve for, you know, higher dimensions and then just checking only those solutions and just outputting the best. So, you know, the knapsack was one case where the objective function was something simple like maximize one subject to a threshold constraint on another. But, you know, there are other examples where things like, um, you know, Papadimitra and Yanakakis initiated some study of, you know, um, uh, approximate Pareto curves. And there they had examples where, you know, in some web services, you actually had, you know, a couple different objective functions, and really what you were trying to optimize was some very strange function of those. So in those cases, there's really, I mean, there's not too much structure in the objective function other than it's monotone. And in those cases, you still have an approach because you know that points which are dominated are still not optimal solutions. So that would it, I would say is maybe the, the canonical sort of example of power dimensions. Any question? Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thanks, Andre.